Hello, you're listening to the podcast of Bay Ridge Christian Church. Each Sunday, our aim is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ from the text of the Bible and to catalyze the hearts of our hearers to love and gratitude towards God and all of His creation. We hope you enjoy this teaching, and we pray that you will be encouraged to trust in Jesus today. So today we are going to be, I, I decided I had actually done most of the teaching for, uh, for this week, and uh, then decided that since we were having two water baptisms and we haven't taught on it in a while, I was just going to do a teaching on what is water baptism. Why do we do what we just did? What is that about? And so for doing that, we're actually going to have two passages today. There are so many on water baptism in the New Testament. I'm just going to pick out two to kind of show certain central themes. And actually, in answering the question, what is water baptism, um, this is coming out of our catechism. We have a question, question 75, that says, what is water baptism? And so uh, I'm just going to be kind of going through that where we've tried to pull together what the Scripture teaches us on water baptism. And I um, want to encourage you as we do that as well, uh, if you've never been water baptized, please see me. But even if you have, there's uh, an old subject or an old idea that the Puritans had that's called improving your baptism, which meant whenever you see another water baptism, it's a reminder of what God did in your own life. In Israel, you know, when you read in the Old Testament, they would set up these stones. You remember Ebenezer, thus far has the Lord helped me. Well, that was an Ebenezer right there. It'll be easy for Vicki to remember it's her birthday every year. It can roll around and she can be reminded of that, you know, and for Victor to be remembering that this is something that the Lord did and we do the same thing in our lives. So let's go ahead and pray and then we will uh, dig into God's word. Father, what a joyful thing it is to see and observe as you are at work in the lives of people here and around the world. Um, Lord, we are so grateful for uh, the various means of grace that you have given us. Lord, as we have worshiped you today, as we're fellowshipping with one another, as we pray, uh, Lord, as we are, we've observed uh, water baptisms, we're going to come to your table later, and right now, Lord, we're going to open your word. All of these are means and ways you've given us to be built up in our faith. But Lord, we recognize in all of these things, we are dependent upon the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we've seen over and over again that even when Jesus spoke the very words of God, many people did not understand. It was a mystery. And Lord, we are not in a place where uh, it makes us any different than they are. Lord, we are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. So we ask for the Spirit to come. And to speak to us. Lord, we pray, not only for us in this room, we pray for the kids upstairs as they're hearing about water baptism, that Lord God, you would speak to them, that you would be pleased. Lord, I pray that you would be drawing our children to faith. And Father, I pray for other congregations in this area as well, that you would speak to them this day through your word, by your Holy Spirit, that they would be drawn in and that Lord, they would be built up in their faith as they hear, and that then we could walk forth as obedient disciples of Jesus. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be looking at two passages of Scripture. First, Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 to 15, and then Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 7. Both of them are in your booklet, and you can follow along in your Bible. I'll also bring up just a few other verses uh, scattered throughout the teaching. So Colossians chapter 2 and then Romans chapter 6. Hear now the word of our covenant God. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. Not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. 
He forgave all our sins, having canceled the written code and its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Mm. And then Romans chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Mm. So uh, today we're going to talk about water baptism. And again, we just obviously observe two people being water baptized and that is not something that is unique to us. This is something that Christians have been doing throughout the entire history of the Christian church. And so we can forget to sometimes ask, why is it that we do this? Why have Christians, whether it's in a baptismal like we did this morning, in some places you go down to the river, uh, you know, and you do it in some uh, traditions, they sprinkle rather than immerse. Uh, but Christians have been doing this for thousands of years, why do we do this? What is water baptism? What, what is the reason that the church has engaged in this? Now, we answer this question in our catechism, in uh, question 75. In a catechism, it's not a phrase a lot of people use, but it's just, it's an ancient format of teaching where you ask a question and you give an answer. And we've actually got 98 questions in our catechism that goes through the essential things of the Christian faith, including we go through the Ten Commandments. Uh, we've got the Apostles' Creed that we sang, something based on earlier. We're actually going to recite it later when we come to the Lord's table. Um, we, we've got the Lord's Prayer. We've got a lot about sacraments and how we grow in the faith. All of these things are contained in uh, our catechism. But one of the questions is there on water baptism. And we ask, what is water baptism? And the answer is, water baptism is the sign and seal of our union with Christ and the cleansing he provides for sin, a means of grace to, uh, to provide strength in our struggle against sin, and the medium through which we testify of our faith in Christ and membership in the church. So I'm going to break all of these down this morning and actually show that talk about what this is, and it's an opportunity for us to again understand what we just did, understand part of the faith, and uh, for you and I who've been baptized long ago to uh, improve upon our baptism, so to speak. So we begin with the first thing is water baptism is a sign and a seal of our union with Christ, and we add the phrase there, uh, and the cleansing he provides for sin. Now, a sign and a seal is a reference that something is a covenant symbol. That's the phrase that's used to represent that things God does. When he makes a covenant, God gives signs or things that seal the covenant. And notice in Colossians 2, Paul makes this interesting statement. He says, in him you were also circumcised. And remember, he's writing to Gentiles. So they were not circumcised as children. In fact, many of them were not circumcised when they were reading these words. W what does he mean? He says, notice in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. Paul is making a link between water baptism and circumcision. Now, on one hand, they're very different things. One was obviously cutting away foreskin on a male. The other one involves water uh, and doing this. One only applied to males. The other applies to everybody who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. There are other discontinuities as well. But one of the things that is a continuity is they're both covenant signs and seals. In the Old Testament, when one became part of the people of God, what happened to the males? 
they were circumcised. And in fact, the Lord said, look, if you're not circumcised, you're cut off from the people. You can't participate in the Passover meal. You can't do anything. You must be circumcised. Even when people are older, males coming in, it's what you had to do. Well, in the new covenant, the sign and the seal, the symbol that shows we are part of God's covenant people is no longer circumcision. Circumcision doesn't count for anything anymore, Paul says. Now it is water baptism. So God always gives a symbol of his covenant. A covenant is an oath. It is a binding uh, a promise, oath, and relationship between two parties. And in it, there was always a sign and a seal. We have, for example, another uh, famous covenant ceremony is a wedding. And what's the sign, the seal that we give at a wedding? Our rings, right? It is a symbol of the two becoming one. Well, we have a sign and a seal of our union with Christ, and that is water baptism. And we can see actually throughout the entire passage in Colossians 2, everything is about our union with Christ. So I'm throwing up on the screen here verses 9 to 12, and notice uh, five different times in four verses we read, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity. You've been given fullness in Christ. In him you were circumcised. Uh, you were buried with him in baptism. You were raised with him through your faith in the power of God. So notice what Paul is saying here is everything that you have in your salvation comes because you are in union with Jesus Christ. You are with Christ. You are in Christ. Everything you have comes from Christ. So if you want to think about it, it is in him that we are cleansed from our sins. It is in him that we are justified. It is in him that we are adopted. It is in him that we are given the Holy Spirit. It is in him that we are sanctified, set apart, and begin growing in holiness. And it is in him that we are waiting to one day be glorified in him in eternity. Everything you have is in Christ. And apart from him, you have nothing. The Apostle Paul, in another place, we're not going to put this verse up, but in 2 Corinthians, Paul puts it this way. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. And so through him, we speak the amen to the glory of God. So our only part is God makes the promise, God keeps the promise, it's all done in Christ, and we just say, so be it. Amen. Uh, and that's what we are doing. And water baptism, our union with Christ, this in him, in Christ, with him, all of this is symbolized in our water baptism. And very specifically, we'll go to the passage in Romans, it unites us with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. We see that in Colossians, but even more clearly in Romans chapter 6, you may recognize these words. I just quoted them in both water baptisms that we did. This is usually the words we use. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, notice that phrase again, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So notice we are baptized into Christ. At the end of the service today, I'm going to be using Galatians 3 for part of our, for our benediction, our blessing at the end. And there Paul says, if you've been baptized into Christ, you are clothed with Christ. These phrases over and over again, they're all about our union with Jesus. But notice here it specifically, we are baptized into Jesus' death. We are buried with him in baptism and raised with him into new life. One of the reasons we practice by immersion is because it's a much clearer picture of what's going on here. You are buried with him and you are raised with him. Okay, and so that's what they say is going on here in Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is telling us. Now, specifically, of course, our union with him that we really kind of reenact and talk about in water baptism is the cleansing of sin. And notice this again, we could look in both passages, and if you just think about it, obviously water is often used for purification. Uh, it's a thing that cleanses uh, but Paul specifically tells us this in Colossians chapter 2. Notice again, 
in verses, this is 11 to 13. He says, in him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. And down in verse 13, he refers to before we were in Christ, we were dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our sinful nature, but God made us alive in Christ, forgiving all our sins. So notice when Paul is using this language here, and again, this is all surrounding the phrase about baptism, having been buried with him in baptism. He says that what water baptism is doing is it is pointing to the circumcision, the cutting off of the sinful nature, or in fact, the cleansing from sin. So the cleansing and the forgiveness come through the blood of Jesus Christ. I can go into the waters of baptism uh, and go down a wet sinner, I mean a dry sinner, and come up a wet sinner, okay? It's Jesus' blood that cleanses us from sin, which we will reenact in the sacrament of the Lord's table later on. But notice, water baptism is a pointing to that because you and I can't observe sin being washed away, can we? So God in his grace gives us visible symbols that says, you may not be able to see it like I see it in the Spirit, but here's a thing that's pointing to what's actually happened. This person's sins have been washed away. Just as surely as they've gone under the water and come up, the, the old person has been buried and they are rising to walk in newness of life. So that's the first thing that goes on in water baptism. And that alone is critically important. But secondly, notice water baptism is a means of grace in our struggle against sin. So in the question, we move on and say that water baptism is not only a sign and seal, but it is a means of grace to provide strength in our struggle against sin. Now, what do we mean by the phrase means of grace? I'm not going to go into this deeply this morning, but a means of grace, we actually have a question in our catechism on this, what is a means of grace? It is a specific activities which God has promised to meet his people and strengthen them by his grace. Now, you and I have probably experienced God in a variety of places and ways. I can remember one of the, the times that I felt very close to God. I was standing junior officer of the deck on my first class cruise on a frigate off of Southern California. And we were out and the waves were pretty good and I was standing out kind of on the wing and the spray was hitting me in the face and I was actually singing a song uh, a worship song I know they call that they go that go down to the sea in ships and do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord. I was 21 years old. I still remember that like it was yesterday. God met me. But if I really need to meet Jesus and get strength from him, I don't recommend volunteering to be junior officer of the deck on a frigate. Because God has not promised to meet me there. He did that night. But there are ways where God has said, I promise, I vow, I give my word, I will meet you. And those are things that we refer to as the means of grace. God has promised. Whether I feel it or not, when I open the scripture and read, God has promised to feed my soul. I may not feel anything, but God has met me. Some weeks you may come to the Lord's table and say, I didn't really sense anything happening today. Does it? God has promised that he has met you and fed you with his grace at the Lord's table. And so a means of grace, and again, you can look at Catechism Question 44, and, and in the booklet I've got more information where we've talked about this in the past. But a means of grace is a way where God has said, I give you my covenant vow. When you do this, I meet you. I am there with you. Well, Water baptism is a means of grace, and that means it's more than just an external symbol. God actually was doing something in those waters, more than just a symbol. Uh, he, it's a means of grace. So notice in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he says, in him you also were circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. Notice he doesn't say 
symbolizing the putting off of the sinful nature, in the putting off of the sinful nature. Not with the circumcision done by the hands of men. He said, I'm not talking about the thing that may or may not have been done to you and you were a young male child being born. No, I'm talking about the one that was done by Christ having been buried with him in baptism. And so he's saying Christ is actually doing something here. This putting off, the, the NIV's got the phrase sinful nature. This has always been a complex thing. The Greek word sarx literally meant flesh, but Paul is clearly not talking about our flesh. He's literally talking about the old nature, that part of us that wants to run after sin, that is allied with sin, that wants to vow allegiance to Satan. Paul is telling us here that God graciously in Christ deals with that and he links it with water baptism. Now, he does the same thing in Romans chapter 6. Notice in Romans 6, if you read verses uh, 3 three to seven in our text. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And let me give a little bit of uh, a background here. In Romans 1 to 5, Paul has dealt with the gospel. And then he begins Romans 6 by saying, what shall we say then? Shall we sin so that grace may increase? He says, well, this is the, if, if Jesus just forgives sin, doesn't this lead to the idea that what a great deal. Jesus likes to forgive sin. I like to sin. We've got a great partnership going here. And Paul says, God forbid. No. That's the context of what he's talking about. So he's dealing with why a Christian can't just live in sin. Here's why. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And then notice verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with or might be rendered powerless that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So notice what he's saying there in that verse at the end. Look, Jesus has dealt with the old nature. In Colossians, he uses the phrase of uncircumcision, uh, being circumcised. Here, he now says it's being crucified with Christ. He's being rendered powerless. It's being done away with. Why? So that we are no longer slaves to sin. The old nature is crucified. So what do we do with a dead body? You bury it. And where do we bury it? In water baptism. That's what Paul says is going on here. You were buried with him in baptism, raised with him. And note the thing, when Jesus walked out of that tomb on that Easter morning all those years ago, he lives a different kind of life. He's still fully human, but you notice what we see in the post-resurrection appearances, like you remember the, they've got all the doors locked and Jesus is somehow in the room? Do we read any of that in the Gospels? No. But now we do post-resurrection because he's living a new pattern of life. He is living a post-resurrection life. Well, Paul says the same thing here. Look, when you come to Christ, your old uncircumcised sinful nature is circumcised. Your old flesh is crucified with Christ. And then you bury that in the waters of baptism. Why? Because you want to walk in newness of life. So you heard both Victor and Vicky say this morning, I, I want to be a, a, a new woman and a new man. I always tell people, because I still remember it so well, I remember each of my kids when they wanted to get water baptized, and we talked about it, but the one I specifically remember on this was my daughter, Stephanie, who's not here to get embarrassed as I say it, uh, but she was like six, and I said, Princess, why do you want to be water baptized? And she said, because I want to be a new woman. I said, well, there you go. Let's go get this taken care of. Uh, great answer. Because Paul says that's actually what is going on. Now, that does not mean that we become sinless, but it is a means of grace to strengthen me in the struggle against sin. Now, y'all help me here. Who in here needs help in the struggle against sin? Okay, if you're breathing, you need help, okay? Um, I, was, I was at a meeting the other day with, with pastors, and one of them is 84 years old, and he, he 
been a pastor for 47 years and joked and he said, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not dead, okay? Long as we're breathing, we need help in our struggle against sin. Well, God has said, I've given you a gift where I promise to help you, water baptism. And so it is that means of grace to help us, give us strength, and let us live as the disciple of Christ. And then there's a third thing that's going on in water baptism. We are united with Christ. That is the work of God. The old nature is circumcised. The old man is crucified and buried in water baptism. That is also God's work. And then the third part is our response back to God, which is we testify of our faith and our membership in the local church. So again, in the catechism, we put it as the medium through which we testify of our faith in Christ and membership in the church. See, in water baptism, we are showing everyone else externally, visibly, and saying, I am part of the people of God. I am united with Jesus Christ by faith. My sins have been washed away. Though they are many, they have been washed away. They have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. It's how we show that we've come to membership in Jesus. See, today, now we love a lot of things in our culture, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with these. But I like to get a t-shirt that says I'm a Christian now, or I wear, you know, something around my neck that says I do it. But see, none of those are the way that Jesus has actually told us how we testify to the world, I'm his disciple and follower. How did he tell us to do it? Water baptism. Here's a good clue for you. Write this down. When Jesus gives you a way to do something, don't try and come up with a better way. Just do the one he gave you. Just follow what he gave you to do. And that is water baptism. And this isn't something that the church just came up with. This is actually what Jesus told us. So in his last recorded words in the Gospel of Matthew, we read the Great Commission, and we've all heard many times, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Now the the verb in this verse is not go. It's actually make disciples. Everything in the verse is about making disciples. To do that, you're going to have to go. we got to go to the farthest corners of the earth. But how are disciples made? Jesus tells us, well, there's two parts. Baptize them and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you to do. So notice here, disciples are seen how? They get baptized. And then they sit and learn Jesus' commands. And so Literally, help me do the math, if there's two parts to being a disciple and one of those two is water baptism, how, what, what percentage is that? It's 50%. It's very straight. See, Jesus makes this very easy. There's not 27 phases to it. It's two. You're a disciple, get baptized. And then start hearing my word and learning how to obey me in all of life. And so we don't have to look for other ways for people to be identified as disciples. It's again, it's not necessarily a wrong thing, but I remember when I was a young believer, you know, take your Bible out and write down today, or have you prayed the sinner's prayer? Uh, Sometimes, you know, it was, did you go to a crusade and walk down the aisle and do a particular thing? Not saying that any of those things are terrible in and of themselves, but Jesus gave us a way to do it. How is it that I testify of my faith in Christ? Water baptism. Every other thing is inconsequential. And so all who claim to be a disciple of Christ are called to be water baptized. Now, this is how we see it was done in the early church. It's not like Jesus did it and the church said, well, we're going to improve upon it. They followed exactly what he said. We, we move forward. You know, here we are in the, the season after Easter. Well, they did the same thing. And you remember the day of Pentecost comes, 50 days after Easter. The apostles and the early followers are filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter stands up and preaches a sermon. And we're told everyone is cut to the heart. They realize their sin as Peter proclaims the law and the gospel to them. And they cry out and they say, what must we do? We are guilty. We have sinned. What do we do? And Peter says, sign our pledge card and begin giving every week. Right? What is Peter's answer? Repent 
and be baptized. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Do you notice how, how broad that is? Look, we're doing what Jesus told us to do. This is the, on, on the first day where the Spirit has descended upon his people and repent and be baptized. This is what you do. And notice, this is not just for us here today and then we'll change it in the future. No, it is for you. If your children repent and they understand, they're to get baptized too. What about people who are far away from Jerusalem? They're included too. What about people who are not here at this time but it's going to be in future generations? They're included too. Everyone God will ever call into his kingdom, when they respond, they get water baptized. And notice, on top of being united with Christ and testifying of it in water baptism, they also are being united into uh, a local church and becoming part of that church. How do we know this? Uh, Luke records what happened. So Acts 2, 41 and 42. Those who accepted his message were what? Baptized. That's what they did. Okay, you told us to repent and be baptized. I've repented. Let's get baptized. And notice about 3,000 were added to their number that day. But what an interesting phrase. It's not just 3,000 were baptized. They were actually added to their number, which is Luke saying they became part of the church. And how do we know that? Notice how he describes them. They, were de they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's the teaching of God's word, to fellowship, building relationships with one another, the breaking of bread, which is Luke's phrase for the Lord's table, and prayer. They became part of the local church community. They were building relationships. They were building into the community. They were gathering for worship, where they heard the word of God taught, where uh, they were in fellowship with one another. They came to the Lord's table. They were praying with one another. These folks became part of the local church. And so this is also what is part of water baptism. We're testifying I'm not only united to Christ, I'm united with his people. Because I can't see, we like to break up, no, to be united with Jesus is to be part of his family. It's, it's as if, you know, my wife and I were going to adopt a child and the child said, you know, I've been observing you two and, and I would like Linda to be my mom. Can I skip Brett being my dad? That's understandable, but the answer is no. We're a package. You get one, you get both. Well, when you come to Jesus and you're baptized into Christ, guess what else is going on? We're also made to be part of the church. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says that when you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are baptized into the church. You are baptized into God's people by the Holy Spirit. It is part of it. And in our water baptism, we're just testifying that that is in fact in the case. So in all of this, what we're saying is God's the one who acts in our water baptism to unite us to Christ, to empower us when we're baptized. But we are all, we're responding. Just like when Abraham responded in faith, God said, get circumcised. We are responding in it. And what we're saying is, I actually do believe. I am united to Christ by faith and I am part of his people. So how do we apply this? This is very easy and simple. Number one, have I come to Christ? Because again, I want to, uh, don't misunderstand. Every blessing is found where? In Christ. We don't believe in magical ceremonies. Okay? We don't believe. There are segments of the church that came up with a fancy Latin phrase, ex opere operato, and what that meant is in the doing of the thing, it just simply works. Whether the person doing the baptism had faith, whether the person being baptized, it doesn't matter. You, if you do the right ceremony, it automatically works. No. Everything is by faith. It is impossible to please God apart from faith. So apart from faith in Christ, water baptism is just getting wet in public. That's all it would be. I remember when I was in Niger, uh, Niger, 
uh, over in West Africa is about 98% Muslim. And so we were doing a lot of evangelism in villages that, where there were few or no Christians at all. And in one of them, we were doing water baptism. And so we were out in public, we dug a hole, we put tarps in, we filled it up, and the whole village had shown up because there was a white guy there talking. And so I was trying to teach on water baptism. When it came time to do it, they all started muttering and, and saying stuff very animatedly, and some of them laughing. And I asked the translator, I said, what is it that they're saying? And he said, they're all saying, he's taking a bath. Why is he doing a bath out in public? Okay, that was kind of their viewpoint. That's not what water baptism is. It's not a public bath. But if we don't have faith, that's all it is. So am I in Christ? Have we looked to him to find forgiveness of sins and new life? And the good news is you don't have to do 20 different things. It's simply looking to him and believing and saying, I believe that you live for me, died for me, were buried for me, were raised for me, and that if I look to you in faith, my sins are forgiven. Have you done that consciously? If you've not, I urge you, do so. Repent, and then come see me, and we'll talk about getting water baptized. Second thing, if we have done that, have I been baptized in water? This is not a nice optional ceremony. This is not a thing to go home and say, you know, I learned a couple of new things I had not considered today. The question is, have I been baptized in water? It's the command of the Lord Jesus Christ for all disciples. And even after all of my explanations, if you're like, I still don't get it, here's a clue, just do what God says. I work hard to understand, I labor, but the most important thing is obedience. And Jesus is really, really clear about this. We are commanded to be water baptized. And it's because it's the covenant symbol given by God and commanded for all of his people. I love that I have a covenant symbol that reminds me and proclaims to the world that I belong to Linda. She is mine and I am hers. And I'm, I'm glad to have that symbol. Well, I have a symbol that tells the world that I belong to Jesus Christ, that he is mine and I am his. And that's that I was water baptized. Um, it's also that means of grace. I've been walking with Jesus for 45 years. Sin is still a present struggle. And I am grateful for means of grace. And I am grateful that I have water baptism where I can say, no, 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 old man, dead. Old man, buried. He doesn't have the right to command me what to do any longer. And then finally, it's the means that Jesus gave to identify as a disciple. So, uh, you, you know, even if you struggle, because one of the things that happened in the early church, they would hear all of this, and like the Emperor Constantine, uh, he's a famous example of this, he's the guy that had said everybody's going to stop killing all the Christians, and then in fact during his time, basically, Christianity went from being illegal to being okay, to being the official thing of the Roman Empire, and Constantine still wasn't even baptized. Because, well, I'm going to wait and do it as close to death as possible, so hopefully I won't sin afterwards. There's nothing in the Scripture about that at all. Okay? This isn't about your faithfulness. It's about God's faithfulness. And so, encourage you, if you've never been water baptized, why not? come in, the water's fine. Okay? Now, we're going to do something else right now, which is we're going to come to our sacramental table. As I said, there's two sacraments in the New Testament, just like there were in the Old Testament. Circumcision is completed and fulfilled in water baptism, and the Passover is completed and fulfilled in the Lord's table. Because the Lord here in communion, Christ our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us once and for all. And so Jesus has given these two new covenant signs and seals. But I want to remind you, we believe both of these are sacraments. Now, don't get scared off by a fancy word, but what we mean by this, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more actually in after hours today. We have another catechism question on what are sacraments. 
Sacraments are symbols, but they're more than just a symbol. They're a special symbol that's given by God to his people that when received in faith, serves as a sign and seal of his promises to us, functions as a means of grace to strengthen us, and through which we testify of our faith in him and his promises. And so just like we've seen that in water baptism, I won't unpack it all for the Lord's table, but I want to encourage you, if we come by faith, Jesus has promised this is not bread and juice. This is where the Lord meets with us. In fact, when, as I'm doing my prayers, I'm going to be praying out of 1 Corinthians 10 in a little bit where Paul actually says the bread we break is a participation, a koinonia, a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup we drink is a koinonia, a participation, a sharing in the blood of Christ. I don't fully understand how everything happens there. I tend to agree with uh, John Callan. I think it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But I do know this. The Lord has promised if I come to this table in faith, it's not just a little ritual. The Lord is going to meet me. The Lord is going to feed me. The Lord is going to strengthen me, cover me, empower me freshly with his grace. Brothers and sisters, you and I need that. You're baptized once. The Lord gives us the privilege every time we gather, we come to his table. Now what we're going to do, if you can stand with me, we're going to begin by confessing the words of the Apostles' Creed to be a confession of the faith. And we sang a song based on this earlier, but why we're doing this is one of the other things that goes on in baptism of the Lord's Supper is this an idea that the elders of Bay Ridge Christian Church came up with? No, this was here long before us and will be here. And in fact, we, we look, read in the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes again, what do we even call it? It's the marriage supper of the Lamb, okay? Even in eternity, we're going to eat and drink with our God. So this is something where we are united with all believers, all times, and all places. Well, one of the things that has done that is believers wrote several creeds early on that said, this is the faith we profess. And the amazing thing is, Christians at all times and places have been able to agree on these things. And so we're going to confess using the words of the Apostles' Creed uh, together, and it'll be up here on the screen, and let's confess this ancient faith together, because the good thing is, we are rooted in a deep ancient faith. Isn't it good to know it didn't begin with us? That we don't have to come up with some way to reinvent it every week, but as we confess in faith, the Holy Spirit is here to powerfully shape us in these very things. There's a song I love that is the creed put to music, and it says, you know, that as he's singing these words, he said, I did not make it. No, it is making me. The Lord's truth is making and shaping us. So let's confess the faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, if you believe this faith that was once for all given, and the phrase there, in case you're wondering, the Holy Catholic Church is not a particular branch of Christianity, Roman Catholicism. The word means universal all believers, all times, all places. If you agree with this faith, I invite you, come to the Lord's table today. For what I receive from the Lord, 
I pass on to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Father, we give you thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ who took flesh to work salvation for us. We break bread now, receiving all the benefits of Christ's saving work and thanking you that we are part of his body, the church. Take and eat. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your blood, which has sealed the new covenant, paid for all our sins, and made us members of your covenant people forever. Take and drink. Let's stand together and we will be crying out for God by his Holy Spirit to work in all of us. And I encourage you, you know, as we've gone through this, a lot of this is pretty basic, but it's a good reminder for every week as we're going through these things, what we're crying out for the Lord to do. We can come in on a weekly basis and sing some songs, hear somebody open the scripture, come to the Lord's table, and go home utterly unchanged because we didn't meet the Lord in faith. And so I encourage you now, let's cry out for the Holy Spirit to work in us and reach out by faith. Holy Spirit, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavens, and united us with him and his body, the church. You are the one who dwells in us, convicts us of our sin, comforts us, guides us, gives us spiritual gifts, and you are the one who empowers us to resist sin <laughs> and obey our Father. You are the one who meets us in the Word and the sacraments so that in the Scripture we hear the voice of our Father. And at the table, we have freshly fed upon the grace of God. So we ask you now, O Spirit of God, fill us anew. We ask you now to stir up the gifts of God within us. We ask you, Holy Spirit, speak to us each day this week and let us experience daily the presence of God so that we might live before his face each moment of each day. Holy Spirit, we pray you would develop in us a strong, well-balanced faith, one that is rooted in the ancient faith, strengthened by the fellowship and communion of the saints, and freshly empowered by you each day. O oh, Spirit of God, we ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior and our King. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now I encourage you, reach out and receive God's blessing by faith. Brothers and sisters, you all are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Jesus Christ. In him there is neither Jew nor Greek, 
slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And since you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to God's promise. You are blessed. Go forth and be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.